Jesus commands us to strive for the kingdom. In my work, my day job at a seminary, the Seattle School, I work to address burnout in the helping professions, especially pastors. And if I were to summarize the root of the burnout process, strive for the kingdom might be a good one. I know one pastor who is suffering burnout, who just started on the pilgrimage to the Camino de Santiago. This is all she can discern to do, to walk her way back to some semblance of hope via a trail all the way across northern Spain. On pilgrimage, everything you need for weeks is carried. She wears one of three sets of clothes that she brought with her. She does not worry about what to wear in a very literal sense, because she has very few options. And she doesn't worry about what she wears in the more figurative sense. She's not worried about how she appears to others, not anxious about proving herself. In the ancient world, worrying about what you wear would be to worry about how others perceive you. Your clothing would convey clear messages about your profession, your wealth, your status in society. Today, our signs are different. A watch, the brand of shoes, the designer of our handbag, but what's conveyed is the same, social status. So when Jesus says, do not worry about what you wear, he's saying to not worry about how you are perceived. Am I good enough, smart enough, holy enough, competent, helpful, insightful enough? Or am I too much, too outspoken, too heady, too emotional? In her burnout, this pastor had to give up her professional identities in order to start her own recovery, in order for new life to be an option. She had to enter death, die to the false self that wanted her to appear competent and capable. She had to die to any notion that it's on her to bring about the kingdom. Trying to appear and act as though she was competent enough, professional enough, sacrificial enough, had only led her into burnout. Meanwhile, I'm here trying to convince you fine people that I'm holy enough or smart enough or have something insightful enough into what Jesus is saying in our gospel text this morning. The bind I'm in is that I'm enacting my anxieties even as I'm preaching about a text that tells me don't be anxious. <laughs> this sermon has been a great temptation to show you all how smart and articulate and creative and scripturally literate I am, to show you that I'm worthy of your time and attention, to show Bishop Rickle that I'm worthy of the preaching award he gave me, and perhaps to show God that I'm worthy of a pulpit, to show that I'm striving for the kingdom. The truth is, I don't know if I'm worthy of any of that. I am anxious about what I wear, don't let the alb fool you. <laughs> I'm anxious about how I appear to you. It feels as though the whole world is geared towards the development of that false self, geared towards being more, smarter, richer, busier, nicer, more respected. And Jesus invites us to let that self die invites us to let anxiety die. In other words, Jesus invites us into faith. I can be anxious about what I wear, or I can have faith that I am acceptable. I can be anxious about the fruits of my labors, my words, my sentences, my ideas, or I can have faith that the work I have done and what I have brought is enough. I can be anxious that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth are pleasing to God, or I can have faith that God will love me no matter how this sermon goes. On Palm Sunday, the youth of my parish, St. Luke's Ballard, led our congregation in the Stations of the Cross. As we walked the neighborhood, they connected the narrative of the Passion to the daily lives of our unhoused neighbors. We stopped in the church's garden, at the urban rest stop, in the library, all places that our neighbors spend time. 
We stopped in the alley where a man who had recently died of exposure and pneumonia, Britt, our vicar, gave the last rites. Our final stop was in the Ballard Park, at the bronze leaves and the sidewalk there. Perhaps you've noticed these leaves and the sidewalks all over the city. They bear the names of men and women who have died on the streets. And we were walking to this memorial when a woman approached us. She had layers of mismatched clothing. Her hair had that kind of fried and frizzled look that it gets when it's not cleaned regularly enough. She hugged Britt and asked what we were all up to. And Britt said, we're going to remember the people who have died. And this woman said, oh, I remember them all. She said it with such depth. Like in that moment, in that very moment, she had all of their faces and their stories and their personalities and their impact on her. And I thought, this woman bears the divine. God is reflected in her. John implores us to confess in our epistle this morning, so here's my sin. With few exceptions, I know most of our unhoused neighbors by what they consume in our ministry that serves breakfast every weekday. I know how many hundred meals we served last week, how many pounds of coffee we went through, how many volunteers it takes to serve that food. And I know our guests to a lesser extent by what they produce, trash and needles left on our property. But this woman, she knew them as people saw them as more than their social standing or their refusal to be good producers or good consumers, their refusal to strive to be better at capitalism. She knew them as fellow journeyers on the road, knew them as the beloved of God. For God doesn't see us for what we wear, doesn't see the dirty mismatched clothing, doesn't see anyone as the addict, doesn't define people by what they don't have. God loves them as this woman does, for the people that they are. Which might seem perhaps like bad news, if you're like me, and you strive to be competent, a capable producer, whose addictions are more socially acceptable, the addictions to helping, to achieving, to busyness, and to praise. But the same is true for me and for us. God doesn't value any of us for the role we play, doesn't see us as the executive, the professional, or the priest. Consider the birds of the air, Jesus invites us. There's a bird that lives near my house that does this little two-note song that just keeps repeating, doo-doo, doo-doo. This morning he started at about 5.30, which I know because I was awake being anxious about this sermon. <laughs> This bird does nothing for me, produces nothing of value, and yet I know it particularly, know it by its voice, by its song, and if it were to go away, I would notice that too. One of the few things birds can be said to produce is their song. They do not pursue ornamentation to convey status, nor do they cover up their plumage. And God loves them as they are, for exactly how they are loves them in their particularity of their song, recognizes the particular importance that each one holds, even the bird who only sings a two-note song. If God values us for something other than how well we perform, something other than how good, productive, helpful, or holy we appear, then striving for the kingdom cannot be the same as striving for God's approval. If God loves us fully and already, perhaps all that is left for us is to respond to how we feel about receiving that love, respond in joy, to do the work that God has given us to do with gladness and singleness of heart, exactly because it brings us gladness in our hearts. It feels to me that the only appropriate response to God's love is to do what I love, 
to live into the authenticity that God has instilled in me. As Ignatius prayed it, all that I am and all that I have you have given to me, and I give it all back to you to be disposed of according to your good pleasure. God delights in our authentic identity as individuals, as well as our collective identities as parishes. Each parish represented here is a different limb on the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. And in appreciating and delighting, our different, delighting in our differences, we call one another to the fullness of our identities. I love the banners. I love how different they are. No two are the same size or the same color scheme or the same symbol. This is us. We are different even as we are together. And we can delight in our difference as we are together. At St. Luke's, we feed people because it brings us joy. Recently, our volunteer coordinated, coordinator granted one of the women our Volunteer Recognition Award. And as we thanked her for her early mornings and her long hours of service, she said, thank you for giving an old widow something to care about. Our joy may not be your joy. It doesn't have to be. Your parish might find joy in gifting the world with beauty and art, or in bringing together people of multiple cultures, or in assisting in refugee resettlement. The joy of being bound to one another is that we can all participate in each other's joy, support one another in our shared joy. We are partners in the work, freed to respond to God's love with joyful acts, freed to live into our particularity, because that is where God most delights in us. You are already loved exactly as you are. You are already loved. You are already loved. May you believe that to be true and respond with what brings you joy.